Hi guys, this is Josh Bertram at Faithful Politics. Thanks for listening in today. We, as always, we have our political. Do I call you the? No, you call me the faithful host. So you must. <laughs> but I don't have like a like a like a good um, what like analog to that for you. Like, is it like uh, the? I guess the political host. I'm the political. The political, but like <laughs> faithful. Yeah. So we have our host Will um, with us today, and also we have a very special guest, Karina Lane. She is a law professor at the University of Richmond. She's been working there for 20 years. Hi, Karina. Um, she was a sergeant in the army and Hi. also a prosecutor for Henrico County, Virginia. And she's been writing on the death penalty, which is for 14 years, which is what we're talking about today, kind of a legal understanding of the death penalty. So Karina, thank you so much. Uh, for coming on the show. It's really great to have you here with us today. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This will be fun. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, you know, to, to write on the death penalty for so long, um, like, does that make you a morbid person or a really hopeful and optimistic person? <laughs> Oh, that's such a good starting question. Um, I think it makes me a little of both. Um, so I have a pretty uh, optimistic outlook. And um, sometimes when people find out that I write on the death penalty, they're like, wouldn't have guessed it. Um, but, you know, the, I mean, it's it's in some ways the darkest. It's, it's our darkest selves, the darkest side of humanity, um, because you can't study the death penalty without really um, owning, you know, seeing for, you know, for yourselves, these, these really quite terrible crimes. And so there's certainly a darkness there. Um, but yeah, actually, Josh, I would say that there, that there is an optimism there too. There's something to be said for the human spirit and redemption. Um, and so, yeah, both. Mm -hmm. And I've learned mm -hmm. a lot. Now, now so, to just that. <laughs> To start us off, um, can you um, maybe give our listeners and viewers, you know, a little bit of the history of the death penalty, um, and and maybe as a as a follow on when you're done, um, kind of put it in context to what other countries actually do. Ah, uh, sure. Um, well, the history goes way back. Um, uh, so from colonial times, what one thing about the history, and I'm a legal historian, so uh, this is something that is particularly of interest to me, but one of the things that's really interesting about the death penalty that most people don't know is that the Supreme Court invalidated it in 1972. So um, in 1972, the Supreme Court ruled that all of the state statutes, uh, the way the states were conducting the death penalty, administering it, um, all of that was unconstitutional. It was a violation of the Eighth Amendment. And so it struck down every single state statute in the country. Uh, so, and the death penalty had been pardon the pun, slowly dying out. Um, so we, by the time the Supreme Court decided that in 1972, the country had not had a single execution since 1968. So it had already gone four years um, without having any executions. And um, very interestingly, like the papers the next day uh, said, you know, well, you know, the, it, it, the death penalty finally made, met its demise. Um, one particular article said something like, you know, the Supreme Court was just shutting out the lights after everyone had left. Um, another said uh, that the reaction was a collective yawn. You know, so this was something that people saw coming um, and the Supreme Court invalidated it. And then what happened was uh, a number of states immediately uh, passed new death penalty statutes that uh, they said complied with, uh, you know, that, that, that solved the problems that the court had found with it. And there was a rush of, you know, it's just, it was just such a remarkable turn. Um, but there was a rush of capital statutes passed. Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, 
death penalty support made a rebound within six months of the court's decision. And in fact, there was some outrage. I can't remember which state it was, but the state had already abolished the death penalty itself. And people were complaining that the court took it, took their death penalty away. And it's like, no, you had already get, gotten rid of it. Um, but they were still mad that the court took it away. Um, so, you know, you, um, Furman is the decision from 1972. And it's actually famous um, for being one of the strongest backlashes in Supreme Court history. So the court takes another case in 1976 and bows to uh, popular sentiment and says, okay, you fix those problems. And so 1976, and I'm moving pretty quickly, but, you know, we could we could spend the whole time talking about the history, but um, 1976 <laughs> sure. starts what we call the modern era of the death penalty. And it's gone from there. Wow. And, and, uh, and is, is America the only place that executes people or is, or is it like, I mean, I know there's countries like Saudi Arabia that still have public executions, but you know, where does, where does America stand kind of on the global stage for, for capital punishment? Yeah, really good question. So I actually pulled up um, their uh, Amnesty International actually does a report every single year and uh, tracks the executions. And so here's 2019. The 2020 report hasn't come out yet. Um, number one is China. Thousands. They just don't even have a list. They just said thousands. Number two, Iran. 250. Uh, number three, Saudi Arabia, 184. Number four, Iraq, a little over 100. Uh, five, Egypt, 32. Number six, USA, 22. So we're six, we are the sixth most executing country in the world. And the ones in front of us are China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Egypt. Now, after us, just rounding out the top 10, Pakistan. Somalia, South Sudan, Yemen, Singapore, wow. Bahrain. So Very much religious me. countries, except China, I guess. Just to give us, just to give you <laughs> yeah. a sense. So much. Yeah, so much for making America first, I guess. Yeah, um, we're right, top Josh? ten at least. Though. <laughs> top ten. Hey, make America great. And that's what it was. Don't make America first. <laughs> Although maybe he yeah. would have done that with another four years. Uh, um, who, who knows? Car Karina, I, um, I just had a quick question. So when we're thinking about the uh, um, the death penalty, I guess I have a comment and a question because I was actually talking to my wife. I did qu uh, 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 quite a bit of reading actually in preparation for this. And I said to her, you know, I, you know, I don't know if I'd want to be a death penalty scholar <laughs> because of the very things we were talking about, like it's, it would be kind of, it would be really hard. Um, but one of the, uh, one of the, questions i think that are that are i did choose um, it by the way listeners oh yeah i know you well maybe we can get into that but one of the questions that our listeners and viewers might be interested in is what constitutionally like where does the death penalty fall in terms of the constitution like we're talking about like the supreme court and validating it and then it coming back where, where is that even found? Because if I look in the Supreme, I mean, the Constitution doesn't say thou shalt not kill um, or thou shalt kill or whatever, like in um, like something like that. But wh where is that found? Like, wh what are we talking about when we're talking about the death penalty in American law in terms of the Constitution? Yeah. So where is it situated legally? Um, it, it It's actually found in a lot of places. So the chief, oh, I don't even know if I'd say the chief constitutional provision, but certainly one of the most prominent is the Eighth Amendment uh, protection against cruel and unusual punishments. So that is a chief regula uh, constitutional regulator of the death penalty. Um, you also see constitutional regulation of the death penalty coming in under the due process clause. So, of course, the due process clause says that you cannot be denied, uh, of, among other things, your life uh, or liberty without due process. And so there's some constitutional regulation there. Um, uh, and then, of course, any of the uh, constitutional provisions that regulate the criminal law. 
So your right to a jury. There's some rules regarding capital punishment that are jury related. That fi- that's found in the Sixth Amendment. You know, so any any constitutional provision that is regulating a criminal trial will have particular things to say about the death penalty. But um, well, one of the things that you, that that this brings to mind, I was hoping that um, to mention it anyway, uh, is. Um, that you'll you'll find, for example, that the Constitution explicitly contemplates the death penalty. In other words, um, you see the double jeopardy clause in the Constitution. It says that you um, cannot be placed twice in jeopardy of life or limb, right? And so it contemplates that we will have a death penalty. The due process clause also contemplates a death penalty. Now, Within legal circles, there are are some, for example, the late Justice Scalia, who maintained that because uh, the death penalty is mentioned in this way, that it is per se constitutional, that you should never, uh, you know, that that it is mentioned in the Constitution. And so therefore, like you might be able to regulate it, but but you can't get rid of it. You you know you uh, what happened in Furman was was wrong. Although actually, Scalia said, "Yeah, I can. It makes sense." Um, but you know, I think even Scalia and others too that would take this view have also recognized that just because the Constitution contemplates capital punishment, just because it's mentioned, it's like. Yeah, so it was the three-fifths clause. You know, there was a lot of other things that are mentioned that do not say thou shalt have capital punishment. It's just if you have it. And in fact, you know, I, I have to say when I read it, I say the, the, the death penalty doesn't appear alone anywhere. What it says is if you have it, you can't put someone twice in jeopardy. If you have it, you have to satisfy due process. You know, there's conditions on it uh, anywhere it appears. It, there are conditions on it. And so um, there's a whole body of law under various provisions that have grown out of those provisions. Um, I, you know, my little saying, um, and it's not really legal, but I think it fits, is just because you have the death penalty doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so that's where the states get. Now that's a really good point. You know, I, so you've mentioned um, Furman a couple times. What and how it how it invalidated that? And I and I did a little bit of reading myself on Furman, um, and that it was. Um, and, and I wanted to get your sense of like what was this Furman v. Georgia, right? So it's Furman versus the state of Georgia. What what were kind of like a summary of the uh, of the context of this case and what was it about the death penalty that that they said like they invalidated because if i remember two people two supreme court justices completely thought it was just not in the constitution at all and then three thought it was or they didn't attack that part but in it was more procedural so w- w- what actually happened in Furman that made it so that it would become um, essentially banned for uh, for for a time. Yeah, great question. By the way, I'm already having so much fun. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so, so here's the thing, Furman at the time. So now you're going to get some little tidbits too. Um, but Furman at the time was the longest Supreme Court decision ever to grace the U.S. uh, reports. It's the longest decision. And the reason why it was the longest decision is because all nine of the justices wrote a separate, each of them wrote a separate opinion. So there were five majority opinions, not one. Not like one with some concurrences. No, each of the five justices wrote their own decision. Um, The four dissenting, it was a 5-4 vote. The four dissenters wrote their own uh, opinions. And for the majority justices, not a single one of the justices in the majority joined another majority justice's opinion. 
So you've got five separate opinions um, that, that are laying out the reasons why the justice voted to invalidate the death penalty. And so all of that is to say, um, you know, what did it come to stand for? Well, it's a little complicated because you have to you have to look at each individual opinion. And there was one thing, just one thing that every single one of those opinions had in common, those five opinions. And that is that the death penalty was arbitrary and capricious. Mm. Now, uh, three of the justices said it's not only arbitrary and capricious, but it's racially discriminatory. So it's very interesting that this was part of their reasoning back in 1972. You know, it's coming up again here in uh, Mm -hmm. 2021. But I mean, this has been in the discourse for a very long time. In any event, um, three justices said it's the way it was applied. Um, So I'm really impressed, by the way, Will, that you, you know, that, that even as an outsider, you were like, so there were three that did this and two that did this. You have it exactly right. Um, three said it was the way it was applied. The other two said, yes, it's the way it is applied. And also, we think it's just wrong. So one of them was uh, uh, one of the justices. Well, actually, both of them. This is Justices Brennan and Marshall. And... Um, they each talked about how uh, society had grown to distance itself, which it had um, o- over time. As I said, the the death you know we had the nation hadn't seen a death sentence or sorry an execution since 1968. So um, there was a longstanding doctrine from the 1950s actually that actually came from a case in 1910. So ju- it like it went pretty deep that talked about evolving standards of decency. And so those two justices said, look at all the states getting rid of it. Nobody's giving death sentences anymore. Nobody's giving, uh, nobody, we're not executing anymore. Society has rejected it. Um, When you think about a cruel and unusual punishment, that's the death penalty. It is, it is cruel, um, right? It's the, it's the death penalty. It's, it's, it's a very extreme penalty and it's unusual. And um, one of the justices, one of the, one of the lines that famous, that Furman is famous for is actually from Justice Stewart, where he says um, that the death penalty is cruel and unusual in the same way being struck by lightning is cruel and unusual. Like, you know, it hurts a lot. <laughs> you could die. And it's just sort of random. Um, so that's the thing that they all had in common. Wow. And yeah, two justices were like, nope, I, we're just done with this. But, you know, in the end, you needed a principle. And the principle that tied all of those opinions together was that the death penalty was was uh, arbitrary and capricious. And there was another point on this, too, that is worth mentioning. Um, and that is that normally we expect the political process to fix the problems that ail society, right? This is a democracy. So our first stop should be the democratic process. And in Furman, um, Anthony Amsterdam, who was one of the most famous advocates and just like renowned, um, I've listened to some of his oral arguments. He's just amazing. But, you know, one of the things that he convinced the justices of, one of the things he argued was the legislatures aren't going to be able to fix this. I've shown you that it's arbitrary and capricious, and it was. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It really, it was, it is. This is an issue. Um, but but part of the argument was legislatures aren't going to be able to fix this. Democracy is like a little turtle on its back right now, and it can't it can't get it can't right itself. Why is that? Because who is being harmed? You know, and what they said is, look, the death penalty is being used against the forlorn, right? Against minorities, against the friendless. Um, and they allegedly committed like these terrible crimes. So people even, you know, hate them for legitimate reasons, right? And so the, there's no political action committee that's going to be um, standing up for them. And and there's no real 
um, you know, the, the, the gears of legislative change were stuck. And so that was part of it. I think, I hope that answered your question. I could go on. I'm afraid uh-huh. I've gone on for too long already. So no, no, that, 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 that's, that, that's perfect. And, and, and also just for a lot of our, um, you know, listeners on the podcast for, for, for people that are listening. Um, so I'm, I'm Will, the political host. And, and the first voice you heard was Josh, the faithful, the faithful voice. Um, and, um, obviously you're listening to Karina Lane, the expert on death penalty, um, and, uh, all around incredible person. Um, the, uh, now, now, now Karina, I, I, I do have a question for you about, um, you know, is there a case to be made for capital punishment? And, and I, what, what's interesting about the question is I believe Josh and I actually stand on very opposite sides on the. Uh, death penalty debate, which is one of the reasons why he's a great co-host because him and I don't don't agree on everything. Um, he likes Chick Fil A. I hate Chick Fil A. I mean, we can go down the list, you know. But um, but on death penalty, like he's for it, I'm against it. So I, I'm curious if there's an argument to be made for the death penalty or for capital punishment. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I think there is a case to be made for it. Um, And, um, you know, I suppose this is a good time for me to confess that I have had, uh, as I tell my students, about every view one could have about the death penalty. I've been a strong death penalty supporter. When I grew up in Montana, I'm a Montana native, and it was just like something, you know, maybe it's like the Southern grits for breakfast or something. Like it's just what you grow up with. And um, it seemed very simple to me. If you don't like the death penalty, well then, you know, don't kill anybody and you'll be fine. Um, As a prosecutor, I saw a lot of blood, had a couple murder cases. Like these are terrible cases. And so I was able to appreciate it and support it from that point of view. Um, You know, then I started studying it, you know, and, um, I remember my first uh, my my first reaction was, "Oh, th- it's got some serious problems. We better fix this because somebody's going to come along and just get rid of it." I mean, that was that was where I came from on this. And then, over time, as I studied it and also uh, testified myself before the General Assembly, I realized they don't want to fix this. They don't want to fix this. They want me to mind my own business. And also there's this, they did bad things so we can do what we want. I am fundamentally opposed to that view. Um, And um, so that gave me a very sort of functional, like, uh, opposition to the death penalty. This, this, like, uh, I, I could support it in theory, but not unless you give people counsel, unless you recognize that if someone, you know, falls asleep and they're your lawyer, you get a new trial. Like we got cases where that's not true. Um, so anyway, uh, but I, all of that is, and then my views have, have, have evolved from there. But all of that is to say, yeah, I think there is a case. And so let me just talk a little bit about that because it's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, I think uh, uh, there's three main arguments for it. One is deterrence. One is retribution. One is incapacitation. So I want to, you know, spend a moment on each of those. So, you know, the case for deterrence is you take a life to save a life. That's, you know, it comes down to that. And um, what I can tell you about that one, I don't think that's the strongest argument, but, you know, that is one that people make. And I think what people don't realize is there's no empirical evidence to support that. Um, so the, um, I actually opened this up so I could you know, share it with you also, but um, the National Academy of Sciences, so this is the National Resource uh, Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences, took a look at all the studies, and there's a lot of them, took a deep look at it, and came out with a report, and it says, and I just quote you the line from the conclusion, the committee concludes that the research to date on the effect of capital punishment on homicide is not informative about whether the effect of capital punishment on homicide 
um, about whether capital punishment decreases, increases, or has no effect on homicide rates. And um, the, the conclusion goes on to say the committee was disappointed to reach the conclusion <laughs> that research conducted in the 30 years <laughs> uh, is, gives us wow. no knowledge. Um, but it says, look, that, you know, we looked at everything and that's the truth. There's no evidence on this. And, you know, so I, I become very, and, and that's the conclusion from a very long report. I would just say to readers, look that up yourself if you want the details. But, um, you know, that's not to say that there isn't a deterrent effect. It's to say that there isn't any empirical research showing that. Um, so, you know, one might make the argument, okay, fine, you, you know, maybe the studies are all messed up or they're inconclusive or they have fundamental flaws, but, you know, we can just think about this and reason this through. Like, you know, that's the whole reason we punish criminals is because we think that it has some deterrent effect. Why wouldn't that work for the death penalty? And um, so the one thing I would say about that is that a good number of people who get the death penalty um, and of capital defendants more largely, people charged with it, um, suffer from serious mental illness. And when I say serious mental illness, I mean uh, it's diagnosed. There's a category in the DSM-5 called serious mental illness. And so, you know, those people People who are psychotic, they're not doing the calculus. <laughs> you know, they're not doing that. People who are crack, on crack and go on some violent spree, they are not pausing to say, hmm, I could get the death penalty for this, right? Like, they're not doing those calculations that deterrence would require. That said, even if they were, I don't know that they'd come to the conclusion that we think they would. Um, one of the reasons is because they, you know, people doing these crimes, they think they're not going to get caught to the extent that they're thinking about it at all. They're not, they're not thinking about that. But um, just to give you some sense, mm -hmm. I just looked it up before our little podcast. Um, in 2019, <laughs> there were 1,600, uh, 16,400 murders, 16,400 murders. Um, in 2019, there were 34 death sentences. Nationwide, 34. Um, now, those death sentences didn't go with those murders. I think it takes a little longer to, to, to work through, you know, to snake through the system. But just to give you some sense, and um, there's one judge that put it, I always remember uh, his words when I think of this point. He says, you not only have to, have to uh, commit a very nasty crime, but you have to be extremely unlucky. Extremely unlucky. So... You know, I think deterrence isn't really what's driving it. And if you look at the Gallup polls, that's not really, I mean, yeah, it's in there, but that's not really what people say. I think the second reason um, is is really what's driving the death penalty and the best defense, which is retribution. Um, and that is, why should they die? Because they deserve it. That's it, you know, because they deserve it. And um I don't know. I have to say that looking at these files, I get that. You know, there are some really terrible, terrible crimes. And it's hard to walk away from that and go, you didn't deserve, you know, like some of these people, they do deserve it. Now, I think there's two other things to think about in that context. You know, one is the question that I always ask, which is fine, they deserve to die, but state, state, have you done the things that you need to do to deserve to take that life, right? It's two pieces of it. And them deserving death is one piece of it. The state mm. doing its Good job point. is the other piece of it. And that's that they really fall down on that. So like, it's got problems. The other one is one that people don't really think about. Um, the other consideration in this regard um, is that it takes a really long time for these death cases to snake their way through the system to move from a conviction to an execution. And um, I mean, it takes, I don't know what the average is right now. I think the last time I looked, it was like 17 years. Wow. But, you know, and so what happens is 
these victims, you know, the victims' family members are just being dragged through the mud for 17 years. It's never over. That closure thing, not happening. And worse than that, well, it, weirder, not, uh, you know, maybe not worse, but really weird is that the people that get executed, they're not the same person that they were 17 years ago. I'm not the same person that I was 17 years ago. And so there's this really weird mm -hmm. sense in which these victims wait a really long time. And then it's, it's almost like they're deprived of the cold hearted killer and, and that you can really yeah. feel good about. Like it's just different when someone walks in and they've, um, you know, given their life over to Christ and started like um, these wonderful programs. And, you know, it, you see that quite a bit, actually. Um, and so wow. the retribution piece is weird. Uh, one might say, well, then just hurry up. Like, let's just let's just be more efficient. The problem with that is that um, two thirds of all death sentences, most people don't know this, are reversed on appeal. And the number one and number two reasons are prosecutorial misconduct. We're talking about hiding exculpatory evidence. We're talking about police lying. We're talking about false lab reports. We could, we could talk about why that is in capital cases, but the number one reason is prosecutorial misconduct. The number two reason for reversal is grossly ineffective assistance of counsel. So those aren't like technicalities. These are things that I think people on both sides of the aisle would rightly denounce and say, oh yeah, we shouldn't like, we shouldn't be executing people if if those two things are happening. So you have to give those, you know, the appeals process is actually really important. Um, okay, so retribution. The third one, I think, uh, for uh, is incapacitation. And there's two ways in which that's true. So incapacitation is just like, you know, we need to take these people off the streets. I mean, the modern answer for that is LWAP, right? We have sentences where it's like, you're never, ever going to be out again. Um, but Life you know, parole. what about if someone's already serving an, an LWAP sentence and they kill? Right. So then you might say, well, what else do we have? I mean, the answer is you have solitary confinement. You can't kill anybody when you never when you have one hour <laughs> of like being in literally it's a dog run uh, mm. a day. So like they even have things for that. But anyway, th you know, those are the. Um, those are the justifications that animate the the policy side of the debate. Mm, wow, that's so, that, that's amazing. Oh, go go ahead, Josh. Oh yeah, I was, I, I I love how you broke that down, and um, it's so helpful. And when I'm thinking about like um, like one of the things that came into my mind in this when you're talking about the retribution, like being the best. Um, case for it. Um, and even as a Christian, you know, trying to figure it out because obviously there's a lot of support for the death penalty among Christians. But I, I read your, um, I read your article, Death Row Calls for Indifference in Redemption of the Soul, in the Redemption of the Soul. And um, one yeah. of the quotes you have, because you outline um, something that Justice Thomas and Justice, uh, former Justice um, Scalia, the late Justice Scalia said, and you outlined this very common thread of reasoning. And I just thought it was so compelling um, what you talked about, like the reasons that we should have humane treatment of people and that we basically don't rape rapists or, and we don't torture people that torture others. And we don't like, uh, kill people in the way that they killed someone. And I just wanted to give you opportunity to talk about that. Cause one of the things you said was that justice Thomas made a quote about, um, well, this murderer, like he, he about solitary confinement, like he, at least like his victims didn't get the same, like they get less room than he has in solitary confinement. And then the second one was Scalia said, 
um, that it was about a really vicious murder where this poor young girl was was raped and then and then killed with her own clothes, um, like stuffed down mm-hmm. her throat, and um, it's just a horrible mm-hmm. um, crime. But basically, he said, um, mm-hmm. uh, 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 you know, being having the lethal injection is uh, is, is basically a preferable death to what they gave to their victim. And you give an argument as to why, like whether you're for the death penalty or 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 against it, and even if you're for it. So guys like me that on kind of principle see like in theory or in principle that that there's something to this, even though procedurally and how it's enacted, I can see like w- w- all the issues. I, I I'm tending to agree a lot more with the more study I'm doing. But what is your argument for the humane treatment, um, like how a society should treat people, and then especially thinking about how Christians should view how society should treat people mm. that are the worst of the worst? Mm. So first, thanks for reading my piece. I really appreciate it. Was awesome. it. It's like you, my mom, a couple other scholars, maybe, you know, my sister. Um, <laughs> But uh, um, so first, just for readers who or or for listeners who didn't read that piece, just to give them, you know, catch them up on this. This was a death row. What I was writing about is a death row challenge. And um, what some people may not know is that solitary confinement on death row, these people are literally living for, again, you know, decades at a time in the space that is literally the side of a the size of a parking lot space. So think about that. As I say, you know, think about living in your bathroom for decades, okay? And um, they're let out once uh, a day uh, in a dog run, uh, but they're fed through um, a slot in the door. They're monitored by cameras, and and um, they have no human interaction. So there was a there was a you know this is part of the setup that this is uh, really inhumane. And Justice Th- Justice Thomas's response was, "Oh yeah, you think that's humane? Well, that parking spot is a lot more space." Then the defendant left his victims in, which is a coffin, okay, that they that they have uh, less space to rest. The other example that you gave was a very famous line from Justice Scalia um, in response to that case where uh, a young girl was uh, raped, strangled with her own panties being shoved down her throat. And I'm, you know, sorry to readers to, but, you know, I think we have to own that, that there are terrible, terrible crimes. I think that's, I I don't think it does the conversation uh, any justice to whitewash really what these underlying crimes are. Um, But in any event, the famous line is, he says, how enviable a death by lethal injection compared to that. Now, you know, both of those are making the same thing. And I have to, you know, before moving on from Scalia's point, I have to tell you the case where he wrote that, the guy was later exonerated by DNA. So, you know, we got to have a whole, this whole other issue of like, yeah, that sounds really good, except he didn't do it. Um, And, and, Anyway, so, you know, there's that. But you're right. It it was an opportunity for me to explore. Um, and I can't remember what year that was. Maybe it was 2015 or 2016. But it was after a spate of botched executions in 2014. And I was thinking, like, why, you know, given what these people have done and given what these justices are saying, why should we care about how they are living out on death row. Why should we care, frankly? Why should we care if an execution gets botched? Why shouldn't we applaud instead? You know, like, okay, you get a little bit of yours, right? You deserved much worse. Why is that? And what I ended up saying um, as I was working through, uh, and and that piece in particular, is it was written in the first person, and I really was was thinking about these things myself. I was like, well, because you know why then don't we rape rapists why don't we torture torturers 
you know, why, you know, I'm not saying like, why as in let's, we should, I'm saying, why would nobody say we should do that? And the answer is the answer to this too. And the answer is because we're society, we're not the bad guys. Like we, there has to be a difference between us. And so frankly, you know, we're civilized society. They are the, you know, the, the, the murderer, the convicted murderer. And they are so bad that we as a civilized society can't stoop that low, right? We can't get even with them because we can't go that low. And what I ended up saying was, you know, the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishments codifies that. It recognizes it. But that principle is not important because it's in the Eighth Amendment. It's in the Eighth Amendment because it's that important, right? It's that important that we, as a civilized society, um treat people fairly and not say, oh, you did this horrible thing. And so therefore you don't get any rights. You don't, you know, we, we're going to torture you. We would never do that. And so it, I, I think it is worth pausing to think about why that is and where it leads us. Mm, wow. That's, that's amazing. Now, now Karina, and, you, and you know, oh. oh, I was just going to say, you know, the backstory to that little piece, by the way, is um, another professor had written on, um, uh, on death row and, uh, the Ohio state law journal called me and said, would you do a response piece? And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a response piece. And a friend of mine, a colleague walked, was walking down the hall, stopped by and said hi to me. I said, oh, I'm working on this, you know, response piece. He's a former justice Scalia clerk. So, um, and, and is also more, more conservative, dear friend. And he said, yeah, you know, the death penalty, I don't know. I'm Catholic. I'm not supposed to like it, but that's never worked for me. I'm just a good Catholic. And I said to him, yeah, you know, me too. Like I I have my reasons for getting, you know, for being opposed to it, but they're very practice, you know, they're, they're very practical. And, um, and I just, I don't know. I just feel like if God, you know, if there, if there was, if there was something wrong with it, I feel like the Holy Spirit would have whispered in my ear. Um, and, and now I never do that because I feel like I'm tempting God or something. Um, because in that piece, I ended up working through and, and looking at, at redemption. And then I was like, oh, gosh, OK, I feel differently now than I did when I said that. And um, so, you know, I'm like, God will get you. Um, but, uh, yeah. so that was kind of a special piece for me. Um, so Karina, it seems like you can't do any research, um, around the death penalty without running across the name George Stinney. And I was wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about who George Stinney is and, and maybe why, why that case is, is so important. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's really interesting is, um, of course, I I know the case, but as a death penalty researcher, I'm like, his is just one of, <laughs> of like so many. So it's sort of almost less special in some really weird way that knowing more because it, you know, the, 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 Circumstances are so sad, and there are so many sad cases. But as for him, um, he was 14. He was 14, 14 year old America, um, African American, South Carolina, um, accused of uh, killing two white girls. Um, uh, he was the youngest American at that particular, well, I think ever. Uh, to be sentenced to death, and it was in nineteen, yeah, nineteen forty-four. Um, so you know, his he was taken from his parents, didn't get a chance to talk to them, wasn't given an attorney. Um, they said the prosecution said he confessed. There was never a record of that. Um, he said uh, that they tortured him and made him confess, and um, you know, I think. 
there's several things that were really terrible about that particular case. But, um, you know, one of them is uh, the case, the whole thing from start to finish uh, fin- isn't, isn't a day. His attorney is um, a tax guy. <laughs> He's not a criminal lawyer. He's a tax guy who's in the middle of a campaign for some public office. Um, uh, the council didn't call any witnesses, you know, didn't cross-examine anyone. Can you imagine that? Even in 1944, like the, the prosecution puts on its case and it's like, nah, no questions. No, I don't, I, we're not going to put anyone on. Like nothing happens. And he gets, um, he gets convicted, uh, and, um, sentenced to death immediately. Again, the entire thing happens in a day. When they go to execute him, so I think there's a deep irony in this. Um, they execute him by the electric chair. We didn't have lethal injection until 1977. So this is the electric chair. They had to use a Bible as a booster seat in the electric chair because he was too small. So, you know, it's just like this perversion. I mean, that is the, the just, um, you know, j- just such a symbol, I think, of, um, it's just so, so perverted. Um, and so they execute him. And then um, later, there's someone else who makes a deathbed confession and says, yeah, I killed those two girls, uh, a white person um, who came from a prominent family. And so it just kind of sits there until 2014. When uh, some students, I think it was Northeastern University, but um, some students say, you know, we, we want to open this back up. Of course, he's long gone, but there is a, you know, a um, very rarely used procedure, um, quorum nobis, they call it. I've never even seen it done. But, you know, it's this it's this thing where it's like, OK, postmortem, we can um you know, we can set aside a conviction. And so they go about showing this evidence. And um, as it turns out, the judge dismisses the case, you know, says, yeah, I'm issuing this quorum nobis um, order. And, you know, in one sense, it's like, "Mm." even the judge said, I don't know whether he did it or not, but this was so poorly done even for 1944, that I have to set this aside. Um, I, you know, I, and I think some of the conversation around that is like, what do you mean even if he did this? Because those students actually showed that somebody else did it. And the police officer who arrested him later told someone, that kid didn't do it. They just needed somebody, you know, to make the fall. So, um, it is a famous case, but you know we could we could talk about the McCollum brothers. That was the Justice Scalia case where they're exonerated by DNA, and they were um, suffered from intellectual disabilities. And you know, like there there's so many stories of these, um, sadly. But I'm glad we're talking about one of them. You know, I, I'm glad we <laughs> yeah, are. Yeah. No. But- no. That- I, I think I think that the the I think the George Stinney case really kind of uh, springboards me into our our last question. Just just I want to be sensitive to to your time, but um, and and that's you know about the racial disparity in executions. Um, you know, I I'm not an expert on the on the topic, but I think you you've you've mentioned earlier in our discussion that you know the the people that are generally sentenced to death are you know folks that have some sort of mental disability um i think you also mentioned something about and the the ethnic disparity um so I, i'd love i'd love to kind of get get your take um on that yeah so um the research is really clear i mean it is relentlessly clear on this issue and it cuts, it, 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 it's clear in two ways. One is a racial disparity of who is getting the death penalty 
and it is minorities. Uh, you know, a statistically significant difference is minorities. But but surprisingly, or, you know, something people don't really think about is there's an even stronger effect, race effect, in the race of the victim. And there was a famous study that came out. It's the Baldus study, B-A-L-D-U-S. Very famous study. It came out of Georgia, ran by a team of researchers. And Georgia, you know, Georgia likes its death penalty. So there were plenty of cases to study. And they studied all the cases um, from 1976, which again is the beginning of the modern era of capital punishment. So they had a, a wealth of cases to study. They looked at all of those cases and they eliminated 230 non-racial variables. I mean, anything you could think of, there's nothing left but race, nothing. And they found that someone who kills a white person is 4.3 more times uh, likely to get the death penalty than someone that kills a black person. Um, And then, uh, and and this, so it goes up before, it goes as part of a challenge before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has to accept the study, you know, and part of the, part of that is if the court had said, oh, that's not enough, show us more studies, they know they're going to get more studies. (laughs) They're going to get it. And so they end up saying, well, yes, that's a study. um, And we're going to, we're going to, it's got some problems, but we're going to accept it as true. But it's not enough to show an Eighth Amendment claim. You have to show purposeful discrimination in your case. So we could pause and think about that. Like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to show that the prosecutor picked you because you're Black or picked you because you killed a white person? Um, But a decade or so ago, the United States GAO, the General Accounting Office, um, this was under the, it might not have been a decade, it was under the... um, Uh, Obama administration. But they looked at 28 different studies across, you know, methodology, you know, uh, just, just different states, different data sets, and found 82%. So they're doing the methodology behind them. They found 82% proved the effect of race. And, um, well, I thought I had it Yeah, actually, I do. So I want to read you the line from the GAO report. They say um, this finding, the finding of the impact of race, this finding was remarkably consistent across data sets, states, data collection methods, analytic techniques, the finding held for high, medium, and low quality studies. It's this is wow. part of the death penalty. And one question we might want to ask now in particular, you know, we're in this moment of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, this is what it comes down to. Like, do Black Lives Matter? This is the place, which is when their life is actually on the line. This is where Black Lives Matter or should matter mm. um, and perhaps don't matter. But, you know, you can you can connect that thread. And um, I think there's some important conversations happening now that weren't happening before. So. Wow, that, that that's. Uh, well, sorry, my mic was off. <laughs> that, that's a uh, that's super heavy. And, um, you know, I guess. I thought that was my last question, but I, I don't want to necessarily end kind of on a on a gloom and doom. And maybe maybe I, I answered my my first question, and maybe it is morbid to study the death penalty. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> the um, what, what are what are what are some some positive trends that that you're seeing um, kind of on on your your side of the the you know the line? Is it good news? Is it bad news? I know that you know in the final days of Trump's presidency, he killed a bunch of people. Um, I'm, that's not necessarily good news for me, at least from, from my viewpoint, but you know, what, what, what are you, what are you seeing that, you know, that's giving you hope? Um, so I think the place I see the most hope is in capital defense. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I think people, good people on both sides of the aisle, no one would say, oh, yeah, if you're 
on trial for and your life is on the line, it's okay if your lawyer falls asleep. It's okay if your lawyer is drunk and walks out of the trial on a recess and blows a 0.27. It's okay if your lawyer is on drugs. It's okay if your lawyer is sleeping with one of the prosecution's witnesses. Like all of these things are cases not only where this happened, but where the court said that's not ineffective assistance of counsel. To me, that's insane. <laughs> that's just so wrong. Um, and so one of the things that's really um, a bright spot is that despite some really bad law, Capital defenders have, you know, cap these capital defenders offices have sprung up around the country. Virginia is one of those places. And when capital defenders got in there, when you had specialists who knew the law, who who knew how to how to research the case, who knew how to put um, the the prosecution to its paces. Um, and uh, do social histories on these people and make the case in mitigation and say, look, you know, this is what they came out of. Um, and sure, you know, don't let them out, but like they're not the worst of the worst. What happened is the death penalty just, it, it's literally disappearing before our eyes. And so, um, you know, so that we had a Capitol Defender's Office come into Virginia um, we are now in year 10 without a single new death sentence. And Virginia is the second most executing state in the country. 10 years without a new death sentence. Um, I think the Capitol Defender's Office came 11 years ago. So like they showed up and it's really made a difference in fairness. And um, and so, you know, that that gives me great hope. Now, I mean, the death penalty is a very divisive issue. So whether this is, whether you view this as good or bad, I could leave you with uh, a, a little bit of data. Um, so in 2019, we had 22 executions. I don't count 2020 because we were in the midst of COVID. I just think that throws all the data off. So 2019, 22 executions. Go back 10 years, 2009. 52 executions. Go back 10 years from that, um, 98 executions. So 20 years ago, we had 98 executions. 2019, we had 22. It's like gone down by 80%. And then you think of death sentences because you have to have death sentences to feed the system. Without death sentences, CEG Virginia, you know, it's going to fade away. So death sentences, 2019, 34 new death sentences in the whole country. That's it. Okay. Including Texas. Okay. Go back 10 years, 1999. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go back 10 years, 2009, 118 new death sentences. Go back another 10 years to 1999, 279 death sentences. 20 years ago, we had 279, 280 death sentences in 2019, we had 34. I don't even know what kind of a decline that is, but like, I don't know, what is that, like 85% or something? Um, but it's just, you know, it's a massive decline. And as death sentences become more rare, and as um, executions become more rare, you know what's happening? The death penalty is becoming more arbitrary and more capricious. And so in some ways, we could circle around to where we started. We could end with where we started, which is Furman. You know, there's a chance, not, I, I think not with this court and this composition, but, you know, this notion of an arbitrary and capricious death penalty, it's really, really uh, arbitrary and capricious now. So, you know, that's the downside. The upside is I, I think it's, I think it's dying. I think it is dying before our very eyes for good or bad. Just say. That's amazing. Hmm. Wow. Well, th that, um, was absolutely so amazing. For... And, um, I, I, 
<laughs> yeah. No, thank, thank you so much, Karina. Um, yes, thank I think you, 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 um, really kind of helped, um, I think educate, I know me for sure. And Josh and, uh, you know, we, we hope our audience as well. And, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that I post your, your article, um, in our show notes. So at least we can extend the number of readers outside of your immediate family and Josh. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate all, all, all the time that you, you gave us and, um, yeah, we hope to have you back hopefully in the, in the future. Yes. Thanks. I'll just say this is, these are really important conversations, whether it's the death penalty or elsewhere, you know, this notion that you would have someone who's like more on the politics side and someone more on faith, somebody who's leaning a little left and somebody leaning a little right. That just doesn't happen enough in the discourse. And so I just want to say this was such an honor to be a part of it. And um, just, just, Good job <laughs> for doing it. Um, thank you. Thank it's, you. A, it's a great service. So, all right. Thanks a bunch. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. And thanks, listeners. And uh, we will uh, talk to you next week. All right. Bye bye.